we all eat. Mm -hmm. We're all going to eat all the time. It's not something you can opt out of or into. You just, you know, we all eat. So presumably if a person says, again, I hate coming back to weight because it's such a stupid example relative to say overall health, but let, so let's say health actually. I want to be a much healthier person. So I, I need to change the way I eat. So those, those, that's two things, right? You have to start eating better and stop eating poorer. It is two things, but I view them as two sides of the same coin. Uh, in many cases, you know, we can come up with uh, edge cases or examples where, you know, like the behaviors start to get more specific. But, um, you know, generally speaking, I think there are three ways to break a bad habit. You can eliminate it entirely. So you can just go cold turkey, cut it out, never do it again. You could uh, curtail the behavior to the desired degree so you can reduce it a little bit. You still do it sometimes, but you, you know, instead of drinking a beer at dinner every night, you just have it maybe once a week. And then uh, you could also replace it. So rather than, you know, um, you know, drinking a beer, you replace it with water or whatever. Now, when I'm thinking about myself personally, when I actually am changing behavior, I don't usually think about breaking bad habits that often. Um, in fact, most of the time I'm focused on building or establishing new good behaviors, which necessarily, um, displace the old ones. Like for example, with eating, it is a bit of a zero sum game. I mean, not entirely, I guess you could just keep eating more and more and more. Uh, but generally if you say I'm going to eat more good things, it kind of drives down the bad things. Is that the way it normally works then? I think a lot of the time it does. And that that's why I tend to focus on that for my personal life is that it's kind of like two plants, you know, like one plant, if it grows a little bit more and, you know, spreads its leaves a little further, it starts to crowd out the other plant, you know, it just soaks up more energy and resources and sunlight. Mm -hmm. And your good habits are kind of like that. I mean, we all, in some sense, it is zero sum in the sense that we only have 24 hours in each day. And so, you know, if you have somebody who says, even if they're unrelated habits, they say, Hey, I want to start doing something healthy. I'd like to start, you know, working out for an hour each day. And I also want to watch less TV. I just feel like I watch Netflix too much. Well, you know, if you usually watch Netflix for three hours each evening and you decide to insert your workout from six to 7 PM, by definition, you're not watching Netflix while you're doing that. And so, um, you know, you start to crowd out the bad behavior just by focusing on building a workout habit, even if you don't think about the TV thing at all. So, um, my sort of general approach is, look, I'm trying to spend my 24 hours in the highest leverage way possible, the best way possible, the way that is, you know, moving me toward whatever I'm optimizing for. And so let me just try to continually think about how to upgrade those behaviors. I also like that mindset um, more than the breaking the bad habits one, because it gives me a reason to improve even once I have good habits. You know, like I'm, I'm continually looking for the higher leverage action, even if what I'm doing is already good. Okay, fine. How can I make it great now? And uh, so I tend to focus um, on that style rather than thinking about breaking bad ones, but they definitely are related to answer your question. And I guess like the example that we come back to is smoking. So it's hard to think of because smoking doesn't really take that much time. So it's hard to say, I'm just going to introduce a new habit that will force smoking out. Are, are there other examples though of, of habits where you really do focus on how to break the bad one? Yeah. So to take the smoking example, um, I think it's helpful to divide it into the specific instances in which it happens. So, you know, we kind of lump smoking into a single habit, but the truth is it actually might be a collection of like a dozen habits throughout the day. It might be that you have a habit of smoking when you get in your car for the morning commute. And then you also have a habit of smoking around 1030 when you take a break with your coworker. And then you also have a habit of smoking, um, you know, after dinner on your porch and all three of those are going to have their own cue, craving, response, and reward. And so you, in a sense, you kind of have to intervene in like 12 different places uh, to try to come up with a solution for each one of those. So you might find that like for the morning commute, maybe instead of having a cigarette, um, you know, you come up with something else that you can do on the morning commute while you're, that fulfills that, you know, um, that desire. Maybe, maybe even just a cup of coffee is what wakes you up instead of a cigarette. But that may not work for the 1030 session with your friend. Maybe there you actually need like an e-cigarette to start uh, because you want to have the socialization of feeling like you're smoking with a friend. So you may need to like kind of take it in different stages and break it down uh, to a more a degree where it's easier to have a line of attack. 
The, the environment seems to be so potent. You know, again, David Foster Wallace writes about, or, or when in his commencement speech, this is water, he talks about the ubiquity of water and also the fact that you don't even realize it's there. And that's what makes it mm. so profound, right? Is the he referring to certain thoughts. But I think the same is true of these cues, right? I mean, we, for most of us, we, we're not actually that aware of what it is. You know, you, it can be pointed out to you and you can say, oh yeah, come to think of it, I am a fish swimming in water. Or yeah, come to think of it, every time I get in the car, it's the act of getting in the car and driving to work that signals a change in my, where I'm going and that's what forces me to light up. But, you know, the example of having the cigarette at 1030 with your coworker is a very powerful one because of the connection in the environment. And I remember in my residency, when people would come into the hospital with abscesses from IV drug use. So very, you know, in Baltimore, which is right in my residency, there was, you know, just rampant IV drug use. And you'd be amazed at how much that habit and that addiction could cause a person to do something that at the surface doesn't seem that logical. You know, use dirty needles and needles would break in their abscesses. And, and so you'd be down there and you'd be sort of draining a huge baseball size pus filled abscess that's got broken needles in it. And this person is very sick. I mean, this is a person who's now risking their life due to this. And they would be back in a month with the same thing in a month and a month later, the same thing over and over again. And tragically, eventually a lot of these people would die. But I remember at some point saying to these folks, this was the best advice I could offer, which was not very helpful, was I don't think you can go back to the same place you live. Like, I think you need new friends. Now that's not a very helpful thing to offer somebody who probably doesn't have many choices. But the point was like, how could you expect this person to go back to the same place that they were living in the same environment with all of the same people doing the same things and say, well, you just got to resist it. I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? You, you know, presumably someone who decides they want to stop drinking alcohol really ought not go into a bar that much anymore. Despite, unless you're environment is like a form of gravity, Yeah, you know, like it just pulls on you and you can resist it for a little bit. Uh, but you know, maybe a day or a week or a month, but at some point it just starts to drain on you and, uh, you know, sucks you back in. And to your point about, you know, going back to this environment that prompted the behavior in the first place. I mean, this is one of the stories I share in atomic habits, but it was the surprise that we saw from the Vietnam war, which is so many soldiers were getting addicted to heroin mm -hmm. and drugs when they were over there. And then they came back and we were like, what are we going to do with all these addicted soldiers? And it turns out that 90% of them or more, uh, ended up being fine because they didn't go back to the place where they got addicted. They went home to their friends and family and like they didn't have all the same signals, uh, that were prompting them to pick up the habit. And so they were able to drop it much more easily than we thought they would. And compare that to the typical drug addict who does the reverse. They go into rehab and that's where they leave all of their cues and, uh, influences behind. And then we, you know, once they get clean and they detox, we send them back to the same place where they got addicted before. And, uh, that is a much, much harder, uh, uphill battle. So environment, I, I think it's kind of like the invisible hand that drives our behavior. I mean, we, we, as you said, it's kind of like water, you know, fish in water. We don't realize it. Um, but we all have these things that we say are important to us. Oh, I would like to lose weight or I'd like to build a business or I want to finish a book. But then you look around the spaces where we live and work and the cues of those habits are not a big part of the environment. And, you know, we all are busy, strapped for time, uh, you know, minimal energy. We have kids to take care of or parents to do chores for or friends to see. Um, and whenever we have limited capacity or limited time or we're low on energy or exhausted, what choice do we make? We often choose the thing that is most obvious in the environment. We choose the thing that uh, is the easy choice or the path of least resistance. And so, you know, if I'm recommending a place to start for changing behavior, it's usually either the first law or the third law. It's making it obvious and making it easy because, you know, we can talk about making it easy, but scaling habits down uh, obviously makes it more likely that you're able to complete the task. And making it obvious uh, essentially creates an environment where the good choices are right in front of you, where they're the path of least resistance. And individually, I think it's easy to overlook the importance of this because individually, 
one change to the environment does not usually meaningfully move the needle or change your behavior. But collectively, making a dozen or two dozen or 50 little choices to how your office is laid out and how your living room is laid out and how your kitchen is laid out. Yeah, now all of a sudden you're working and thriving in a space that is um, stacking the odds in your favor. Uh, that's making it more likely that you will just choose the good thing because the healthy food is on the counter and the TV is behind a wall unit and a cabinet where you're less likely to see it. And the remote control is inside a drawer and there's a book in its place. And you have a couple books that are scattered around on your desk waiting for you to pick them up and open them. Um, you can do it with digital spaces too. Like when I wanted to start reading more, I took Audible for audiobooks and I moved it to the home screen on my phone and took all the other apps and moved them to the second screen. That's a very small thing and it doesn't guarantee the behavior, but it's another way to stack the odds in my favor that whenever I open up my phone, I'm reminded to listen to an audiobook for a few minutes rather than browse Instagram. Uh, and the more that you do those kind of things, the more likely good behaviors are to, uh, to arise. So one thing I wanna park for later once we get through the laws is a very specific question around the challenges that some people face and that they don't control their environment. And again, I come back to food because I think for most of my patients and for myself, uh, food is such a struggle because again, it's always around us. You have to do it. It's not a behavior you can just opt out of. And I think those of us that have kids, not to throw our kids under the bus, but I haven't met too many people whose eating habits get better once they have kids. If they're, if they're generally inclined to be healthy people, because at some point you sort of start losing the battle of how much, you know, non crap you can have in the house due to time constraints and the other constraints, which is look, kids are going to eat things that are probably not so bad for them, but I shouldn't be eating. And, uh, you know, wheat thins, my kids love wheat thins, uh, I love wheat thins. I think the difference is they can get away with eating a lot more wheat thins than I can. So I've lost the wheat thin battle. Like we have a pantry that is full of wheat thins and I'm never, at least for the foreseeable future, going to get those wheat thins out of there. So now every time I walk in the pantry, I'm staring down the barrel of wheat thins and I would mm. love to get those wheat thins in the trash. But every time I do, my wife says, understandably, Hey, if you want to be in charge of feeding the kids every meal, knock yourself out chef. But if you're not, let me handle food. And our kids eat well, but they're going to eat wheat thins and a few other things that you don't want to eat. Isn't it kind of fascinating? Like, you know, I mean, you're someone that I think most people would describe as disciplined and high performing and, you know, talented and skilled. And you like look at yourself with that and you're like, wheat thins beat me every time. You know, it's like I, I think about myself. I was uh, doing an interview with somebody else a couple of weeks ago and he was joking about how the number of cookies he can eat is either zero or 30. Because if they're there, then he's going to eat them all. And I'm exactly that way. One of the best hacks that we've come up with is I love chocolate chip cookies and my wife will make them, but she'll like uh, make the balls of dough and then freeze them and put them in the freezer. And at night after dinner, we'll take them out and just take out two and put them on the pan and warm up the oven and put them in. And it's actually a better experience because you get to eat like fresh baked, warm chocolate chip cookies but you'll only eat two because all the rest of them are frozen. And it's just enough friction to know that this is gonna take another 15 minutes if I wanna take two more out and heat them up. And you're like, I don't actually need another cookie. Like I just want to But what, what limits you um, from putting five on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the tray? Great question. We just haven't gotten in the habit of doing that. So hopefully this, uh, that question won't wreck my psyche and now we'll be doing that every night. But um, is part of that the accountability though between you that like probably, if you say I want yeah. five, at least she's going to say. She'd be like, come on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I think we've seen that. Um, we've seen, it's interesting the ways in which, uh, you know, there's a whole discussion we could have about habits and marriage and like relationships and how that influences things. Cause you soak up, each person soaks up a little bit of the other partner, but, um, we've seen it work in a very positive way for training, which is there are going to be some days where I just like, don't feel like working out after, you know, a full day at work, but she's like, all right, we're going to go to the gym. And you know, then I'm like, okay, I'll change, you know? And then other days I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And she's like, all right. You know, and she didn't feel like it. And, uh, that's really helpful, uh, for the long-term consistency. But I've talked to other couples who've said, you know, my nutrition habits actually got worse. Cause like one day I won't feel like cooking and I'll be like, Hey, can we just order out? And she'll be like, okay, fine. And then the other day she won't feel like cooking. Be like, Hey, why don't we pick up something from, and you're like, okay, fine. 
and so you can see how uh, it goes in both directions. And I don't, um, I don't have a good way to describe these kind of upward and downward spirals that we often get into, uh, where the momentum, once it's moving in that direction, you just kind of like, it becomes your default behavior and you just sort of keep rolling with it. But that there's something very powerful about that in life. Um, that if you get on a, a nice trajectory and you got a good spiral working for you, then that momentum just kind of carries you. And if you start to get in a downward spiral, you really got to find a way to just reverse course and gain a foothold, even if it's a really small thing, just to get the momentum moving in the other direction. Uh -huh.